And thanks, dads. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, my dad gives me lots of advice. I like to call it dad advice, right? Um, and sometimes it's great advice. Like he once told me that I should never quit a job until I, or never quit a job until I had a job, right? You should never do that. That's good dad advice. He also told me some things that didn't always make sense. Like I remember one time we were driving by the cemetery and he pointed, he said, you know why there's a fence around there? Because people are dying to get in there. <laughs> right. So I decided I was wondering if my dad was the only one that gave me dad advice. So I went to the internet just to see if there was more dad advice out there. And I found a few. I'd love to share them with you. First one is, my dad once told me, don't feel bad if you strike out. That just means that we can get out of here sooner. <laughs> it's good dad advice. My dad never told me that because I didn't strike out when I played baseball. Yeah. <laughs> All right, second one. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And it's a good thing you're pretty. The next one. Upon leaving for a trip in Mexico, my dad hugged me and said, in case your plane goes down in a fiery abyss, just know that I love you. Come on, man. Oh, that one gets me every time. Mm. All right, next one. The grass may be greener on the other side, but it sure took a whole lot of manure to get it that way. Dad advice. And my favorite one, it's the one that every dad should tell their kids, if it moves and it shouldn't, duct tape, and if it doesn't move and it should, WD-40, yes? <laughs> right? All right, dad advice. Great dad advice out there on the internet. What kind of advice has your dad given you? And as a matter of fact, the better question is, what legacy, fathers, do you want to leave? What legacy do you want to leave? And here's and what I mean by a legacy is this. Every single father in this room is going to leave a legacy. Good legacy, bad legacy. Wonderful legacy, flawed legacy. And the thing is, is, is that the, your legacy is going to be known in the stories that your kiddos tell. The stories that they tell their kids and their kids tell their kids. It's interesting. My grandpa, right, my mom's, my mom's dad, actually lived next door to us with my grandma when we were growing up. And it was interesting because uh, I would go outside and he had, he had the basketball court and I would go over there and within three shots, my grandpa would come up. Every single time, I'd get up one shot, two shots, and the garage door would start to come up. And here would come my grandpa ready to shoot hoops with me. It wasn't just basketball though, it was also uh, as I would work as a pitcher, he was always willing to catch for me. It's funny, actually, my dad once decided to catch for me, and I threw a slider so nasty that it caught him on the inside of his calf and left a massive bruise. So my grandpa, he was a catcher in the Washington Senators organization in the minor leagues. And so he loved to catch for me. And I remember that every single time he would tell me that if I wanted to pitch, he would get out there and he would always do the same thing. It would go like this. <clears throat> All right, Ben, throw strikes. And I knew that if I threw one past him and it would go, I would be the one that would have to get it. So I learned real fast how to throw strikes. See, my grandpa also, when I was in college at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, he would travel around and so he would always make sure that he stopped through Kearney, probably about once a month. He would pick me up from my dorm, he would take me to Bonanza. Does anybody in here remember Bonanza? Let's go. When you're a college kid, Bonanza is the bomb. We would go to Bonanza, we would talk about life, and then he would take me back to the dorm, and every single time as I was getting ready to get out of the car, he would hand me a Gideon Bible. You see, my grandpa was a Gideon. For those of you that don't know what Gideons are, Gideons are the people that put the Bibles in your hotel rooms. They're all the way all around, and they just love to give out the Word of God to anybody and everybody. And there would be these little, these little New Testaments. They were always different colors, orange. I had a lot of orange ones, but orange or black or blue. He would always give me one, and after several months of him doing this, I, I finally looked at him as he was handing me one, and I go, Grandpa, you know that you give me one of these every single time. I've got a ton of them in my room. And he looked at me, and he goes, why are they still in your room? I give them to you so that you can give them to others. See, it's these things that I re remember about my grandpa, right? 
It's these stories that I tell my kids who, and it's interesting because think about it, my grandpa poured into my mom, my mom poured into me, and now I'm pouring into my kids and they'll pour into their kids. You see, the stories that our kids tell are not just gonna end with our kids, they're gonna be told to their grandkids, to their great-grandkids, and on and on and on. You see, fathers, our legacy is not one generation. And if we're honest, dads, how often are the things that our kids remember the things that we wish that they didn't? See, I do these things called life lessons with my kids. When they get in trouble, I like sit them down and I try to tell them the why what they did is, was wrong and I try to explain it. And oftentimes it takes me 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Okay, Faith, thanks. Really? Love you. But oftentimes, and, and actually one time Faith actually goes, Dad, can, we just, can you just give me my punishment and we can move on with it? <laughs> but here's the thing, I'm like, man, the life lessons, I'm dropping, dropping nuggets of gold. Like, I'm giving you all sorts of great things and they don't remember any of that. But the time that I got angry and got frustrated because we spilled milk on the table and in my frustration, I picked it up and I threw the glass into the sink and then I said something along the lines of, we don't cry over spilled milk, but apparently we throw it across the room. <laughs> this is a story that they still tell years later. It happened like eight years ago. Dads, oftentimes the stories that our kids remember are the stories when we were our most frustrated, our most angry, and the things that we wish that our kids would forget. So what stories will your kids tell your grandkids, your great-grandkids. Today, we're gonna look at what the Bible says about having a legacy that lasts. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, will you go ahead and open them up to Psalm chapter 78? And as you turn there, uh, there's a tradition that goes way back in the church where when the word of God was read, the people out of respect and awe and reverence would stand for the reading of the word of God. So this morning, will you stand for the reading of the word of God, please? Psalm 78, starting in verse one, says this. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. You may be seated. Fathers, one of the greatest things that we can do is tell the stories to our kiddos so that we can give awe and wonder to, the, to, to them. Here's the thing. In the first four verses, you saw it. It says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open up my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Fathers, we get the opportunity to tell our kiddos what God has done, both in our life and before. If you look at the Bible, what we see in the Old Testament is there are generation after generation. Some are good and some are bad. Some are good, some are bad. Some are good, some are bad. And oftentimes this is linked to the fact that whether or not the parents told the kids the stories of old. There's a reason why throughout the ages, the story of the Exodus has been passed down and told and told and told. And if you look, when the nation of Israel oftentimes goes into disobedience, it's because fathers stopped telling their children the stories of what God had done. 
Now, this might seem really, really simple, but I'm here to tell you today, fathers, the greatest thing that we can do is tell our kids the stories of how great God is, how amazing God is, how mighty God is. And here's the thing. Oftentimes, Dad, we can do that. We'll be like, okay, I'll tell you in the word of God, but I don't want you just to tell the stories of what God has done in the lives of the Bible people. I want you to do it in the, in, in the sense of what he's done in your life. Dads. Has any of you ever messed up? Raise your hand. Has any of you done anything that you're ashamed of? And here's the thing. The enemy loves to take the things that we've done wrong and tell us to hide them, to bury them. But when we go to our kids and we try to pretend that we're good, that we're perfect, that we're fine, that we didn't mess up, that we didn't screw up, we're not going to tell them the stories of what I did in college. I'm not going to tell them the stories of what I did after college. I'm not going to tell them the stories of what I did in high school. What we do is we present a front that says that I did everything right. And so when our kids mess up, what ends up happening is they're terrified to come tell us. Dads, when we hide our stories, we miss out on opportunity to give glory to God and to move our children closer to him. And I'm not saying go, hey, here's the thing. Whew, I remember when I was in college, I was, whew, I was a party animal. I was getting hammered on Saturday. I was getting high on Friday. I had all the ladies. I, don't, don't do that. <laughs> but, what you, but here's the thing. Looking at your kids and going, when I was in high school, I made a ton of mistakes. Maybe even tell them some of those mistakes and be, but God in his great mercy changed my life. He took a person like me, a wretched, rotten, broken, uh, sinful person and restored me and changed me. See, when we tell our kids that, we don't give them, and we're afraid sometimes we're like, well, if I tell my kid that I smoked weed, then they'll smoke weed. Not necessarily. Sometimes it's when we tell, tell them, I did it, it messed me up, here were the consequences from it, our kids go, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. But they know that when they make a mistake, what ends up happening is that they can come to their dad, they can come to you, and they can say, dad, I messed up, and they know that they'll be met with grace and love and kindness and compassion. Dad, so let's tell our kids the stories of our life, not just the bad stories, but also the good stories. Man, here's what God did. Here is how God's gifted me. Here's how God's talent, like given me these gifts. And let's spend time with our kids, intentional time with our kids to tell them these stories. Can I, I'm going to go on a side tangent real quick. Dads, many of us work real hard. And at the end of a day, have you ever come home and you're just exhausted? Moms, you too. You're just exhausted. And your kids are ready to see their mom or their dad. But you're tired. And so have you ever done this? Here, just play a game. Here, just watch a show. Have you ever put something up on a screen just so that you could decompress and what happens is, is it happens once and you realize, oh man, my kids seem like they're being entertained. And one time turns into another time and another time and another time and another time. And you know what we're doing, guys? We're, we're using entertainment as a babysitter. And I know that some of you in the room are like, yeah, but Ben, you don't understand my life, but can I just tell you what I'm afraid is happening? Entertainment is killing off imagination in our kids. See, when we sacrifice imagination for entertainment, when we sacrifice knowledge and wisdom for information, what ends up happening is our kids stop being able to experience awe and wonder. And when they stop experiencing awe and wonder, then they can't be in awe and wonder of the one who created them, the one who designed them, the one who created this incredible earth. And they get bored because they're overstimulated, they're overentertained, and we do it because we're tired. Do not sacrifice imagination for entertainment. Do not sacrifice wisdom and knowledge for information. Not just for your kid's sake, but for your great grandkid's sake. Because there's an old saying that says what this generation tolerates, the next generation will accept and the next generation will embrace. And I believe that right now we are in a movement where the last generation tolerated a lot of this and now it's being accepted and you're starting to see the, the younger generation embrace things that are not God's best for their life. Because here's the thing, 
when we start to let them be entertained, what ends up happening is we don't control what stories they hear. We let them hear the stories that the world wants to tell them. And there are crafty people out there crafting stories for your kids to see and to hear that manipulate, that wreck, that ruin, and that are changing them. When we stop telling stories and we let others tell the stories for us, suddenly what ends up happening is our kids drift and we don't even see it coming. Fathers, I'm begging you, tell the stories of old to your kids. Tell what God has done to your kids. Tell them what he's done in your life and watch what happens. Anybody in here love campfires? Yeah. Right? Dude, the best stories get told around a bonfire, right? Yeah. And it's always like once one person starts to share the story, then everybody else has a story too, right? It's like, it's like we have like, uh, our, our staff does this a lot of times. It's like, man, here's what God did in my life. Man, I was, I was headed towards destruction. I was doing all sorts of things that I shouldn't. And then God rescued me and saved me on the side of that road when I almost got into a head-on collision because I was drunk. And I'm like, man, that's my story. And then PT's like, hey, I've got a story like that too. I was on the side of the road, Jimmy John's, right? Drugs, deal, all that kind of stuff. And God rescued me. And Cap's like, whoo, I got a story for you. Man, you wouldn't believe what God has done in my life. And then Matt Jackson is like, wow, let me tell you what God has done in my life. And April taps him and goes, hey, you left out some details. Let me tell you what went on with us. And all of a sudden, we've got this like fun story thing. And it's not about how bad we were. It's about how bad we were, but God rescued us. It's not about how good we are. It's about how great God is. And when we start telling the stories of how great God is, suddenly people that don't know them are like, I want to know the God that you're talking about. Evangelism is easy when you just share your story. PGM, I got that for you, brother. Okay, I got to get moving. Ah, I could preach all day, but I got 30 minutes. All right. Verses five and six, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. Here's the thing, did you catch it? He commanded our fathers to teach their children. He commanded our fathers to teach their children. Dad, I know, dads, I know sometimes we can get caught in a spot where we work a lot. See, the, the role of a father in a house, right, is to be the pastor, the protector, and the provider in that order. But sometimes, dads, don't we move the provision to the front? And work starts to, 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 to be so overwhelming 40 hours turns into 50 hours, turns into 60 hours, turns into 70 hours. And oftentimes what, sacri what is sacrificed is our kids. We don't have time to teach them. We don't have time to train them. We don't have time to tell them the stories. But our call, our commission, what the Bible tells us to do, he tells us to teach our children and here's the thing, sometimes because we're so busy and because we don't have a lot of times with our kids, when we do have the time with our kids, we wanna be their best friend. But did you catch what Scott said in the video about his dad, Dan? He said, my dad is my best friend. But here's the thing, I bet Dan, when he was younger, would discipline Scott. I bet Dan, when he was younger, would tell Scott the truth of the word. And so the thing is, is oftentimes, dads, what we do is we sacrifice being a best friend later for being a best friend now. Because when we choose to be a best friend while our kids are teenagers and while they're little, what will often happens is that when they get out there, they have no discipline, they go all their own way, they go the way of the world, and what ends up happening is we're not friends anymore, and by then it's too late, and we feel like I can't discipline my kids anymore. Here's the thing, when we discipline our kids, when we teach our kids, when we train our kids in the years that they need to be taught, then you will be best friends with them when they're grown. Dads are called. Yeah, we can clap. All right, yeah. I right, got my man right there. Getting this going. Hey, this is church. Please talk back. Clap your hands. Come on. I, have, I, I don't want to have all the energy. You guys bring it too. Here we go. Dads, we get the opportunity to teach and train our kids to know the Lord. We get a chance to raise them up. God did not give you, or, sorry, God gave you these children as a gift. He entrusted them to you. You and your wife might have made them, but God created them. God designed them, and God blessed you with them. It is your greatest call is to be a husband first, a father second 
second and a professional third. Now, there's some people in the house right now. I think they're over here somewhere. that are like, whoa, 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 whoa. God is first on our priority list. No. God is too big to be on the priority list. God is your life. He is in all things, through all things, above all things. God is not on the priority list because the reality is, is when you put something on a priority list, it can move around. God should never move. Here's the thing. God is your life. Your number one priority is to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Your number two priority is to train up and love your kids in the way that God would want you to. And then you go to your jobs and you love your coworkers, your employees, the people that God has put around you with the love of Jesus Christ. God is not on the priority list. God is everything. Husbands, love your wives. Train and teach your children. And then go to work. Okay. Here's the thing. Throughout the Bible, we see a lot of stories of very successful men. We see story after story of successful men who have great wealth, who have great power, who have lots of cattle, who have lots of land, who are not good fathers, and they fail to tell their children the story of old. Love Church, may we not be known as the fathers who were successful, who were powerful, who had much clout, but we did not train up this generation to know the Lord. Because as what you're going to see in the next two verses in seven and eight, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Fathers in the room, what we do doesn't just impact our kids. It impacts their kids, their kids, their kids from generation to generation and generation. Dads, we have the chance to get this right. And maybe you're here today, fathers, and you're like, but, but Ben, you don't understand. You don't know my dad. My dad treated me awfully. As a matter of fact, there may be somebody in this room right now that you came to church today because somebody invited you. But the reality is, is that you have a really hard time accepting the love of your heavenly father because of how you were treated by your earthly father. And to you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry on behalf of, of all of the fathers that, you're, that your dad did not treat you the way that you should be treated. You were not loved the way that you should be loved, that you did not receive the love of Christ. But I'm here to tell you, dad, that no matter what your dad did, whether he was stubborn or rebellious, you have the chance to change the generational script. You have a chance to change your legacy today. And here's the thing. There are some of, there are some of you in this room right now that you feel shame right now as I'm talking. You're like, man, ah, I'm so thankful that God rescued me and redeemed me a month ago. But man, I have all of this regret. I've done so many things wrong in my kid's life. What do I do? To you, I'm telling you, you start today with the love of Jesus. Because it's never too late for a fresh start. Yeah. Boom. Boom. Yes. Wonderful. Dads, we have the chance, no matter where we're at, no matter what's happened to us, to start today, to tell the stories of old, to tell the stories. I mean, imagine, it starts like this. You go to your kid and you're like, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. There are two words that should never follow the words, I'm sorry, but or if. So dads, don't go, I'm sorry if I did a bad job. No, 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 no. Faith. Faith. I'm sorry that I've failed you at times. I'm sorry when I've let my anger be bigger than it should be. I'm sorry when I was too busy to listen to what you said. Dads, it's that simple. It starts there. It's being honest. It's being humble. It's being bold enough to say, I'm sorry that I messed up. And by the way, when we do that, it gives glory to God and it gives our children a chance to see the love of a father the way it's supposed to be. 
Dads, we have this opportunity today. And here's the thing. You might say, okay, so what does that look like? Well, I'm going I'm to flip uh, to the right to Luke chapter 15. It's a story that we've all heard. Normally, we call it the story of the prodigal son. But today, we're going to hear it from the story of the prodigal son's father. Because dads, we have the opportunity to learn from the father in this story. For those of you that don't know the story, let me just set it for you real quick. There is a dad. And this dad is very successful. We know that he's successful because he's got servants, he's got money, he's got wealth, he's got uh, a fatted calf, which was rare in the time. He's doing, they're doing just fine. And he has two sons. And one day his youngest son comes to him and his youngest son's a little rebellious. And he turns to his dad and he says, I want my inheritance now because I'm going to go. Now, what he's really saying in this sense is, I wish you were dead. Because here's the thing, all I care about is my inheritance. And I don't get my inheritance until you're dead. I don't care about my relationship with you. I don't love you. I don't care about you. I just want my money and I'm gone. Now dads, in the room, can we be honest for a minute? If our kids came to us and said, dad, I wish you were dead. I just want my money. We would all be like, oh yeah, sure. Cool, 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 cool. Oh, heck no. Oh, no, you didn't. (laughs) But here's the thing. The father in our story has trained his boys up to know the Lord. He's trained them up. And so in this moment, he knows that he has to let them make a choice and it has to be their choice and it has to, he has to let them walk in it. And so he's done the training, he's done the preparing. And so in this moment, he lets the son go. He gives him what he wants and he bounces. And here's the thing, dad's in the room. This would be heart-wrenching. Every time I hear this story, I try to think about one of my daughters doing this. It's probably going to be Grace if it's any of them, but um, (laughs) I'll say faith in the 11. (laughs) But here's the thing. Like, they're going to go. He leaves. He goes. And the father watches his son go. The son that he's poured into. The son that he's loved. The son that he's cared for. And here's the thing. The father never stops giving up hope. His son goes out and he goes and he does all the things. He spends the money on prostitutes and on parties and on drugs and all the things. And eventually the money runs out. And when the money runs out, all of a sudden he has no choice. So he starts to go work for a pig farmer and he ends up finding himself wishing that he could eat the slop that the pigs are eating in that moment. And then one day it hits him. I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father and I'll I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But man, will you hire me as a servant? And so he sits there and he starts to go back. He realizes I can go home and I'll just be a servant. He's got his speech rehearsed. And I just imagine the father, like day after day, the father would go to his front window and he would look down the long stretch where he could see down the road and he would see, is my son coming? Father had hope that maybe one day his son would return. And so every day he would come and he would look. And his son wouldn't come. Day after day, he would look, and his son wouldn't come. Week after week, his son wouldn't come. Month after month, his son wouldn't come. Year after year, his son wouldn't come. But every single day, the dad would go to the front window to see if his son was coming. And then one day, he goes to the window. And a long way off, he sees his son walking down the road. And he loses his mind. I'd lose my mind. And what do I mean by he loses his mind? Well, here's the thing. Women in the room, you understand this. Guys, you don't. But like, if you're wearing a robe or a dress, it's hard to run in that. So what he does is it says that he grabs the bottom and he pulls it up and he just takes off down the road. He doesn't care what's like out there. No, I need you to know this. I know it's funny and it's silly, but I need you to know this because the dad doesn't care. He does not, he's unashamed because he loves his son this much and he wants to get to him as fast as he possibly can. This dad who's been told that he wishes, his son wishes he was dead, who's been told that his son doesn't love him, who's been, who's watched his son walk away, be rebellious and leave. is like, I can't wait to see him again. And look at what happens in verse 20. 
and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. His rehearsed speech. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and the shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Train up your child to know the Lord and the truth will never depart from them. Here's the thing. I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna, I, I got the red numbers, which means I'm over time. Sorry, guys. Um, but here's the thing. There's another brother and he seems like he's the good brother, the brother who does all the right things, the older brother. He's stayed put. He's done everything that his dad's asked. He's worked hard. On the surface, it seems that he is like, he is the good son. But when his brother comes home, what we see is that his brother also struggles with sin because each and every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when his rebellious brother comes home, what ends up happening is the older brother refuses to come in because the reality is, is that even though the son has been doing all the right things, he's resented his father and his brother for the love that he has. Dads, it is possible that one of your kiddos might seem on the surface like everything is together, everything is good, everything is fine, they're going to church, they're doing all the right things, but inside they are dying. This generation hides this stuff really well. And the only way that we can know is when we go to them. And this is the beautiful thing about the, the father. It says that he goes out to the older brother. The same way that he went out to the younger brother, he goes out to the older brother. You see, God is willing to meet us right where we're at no matter what fathers, no matter what season your kids are in, no matter what they're doing, no matter where they're at, may you have loving compassion and always go to your kids. Don't wait for them to bring it to you because the reality is, is if your kids are stuck in sin, if your kids are stuck in a struggle, if your kids are have anxiety or depression or are suicidal thoughts or whatever it is, they're probably not gonna come to you. We have to go to them. Yes. This generation is dying and they're in desperate need for dads to be dads. And it doesn't matter what season they're in. If your kids are little, teach them, train them, tell them the stories of old so that when they get to middle school and high school and start to wonder who they are, they know whose they are. Because every single one of us went through that season in middle school or high school where we were wondering, who am I? And if we're honest, for most of us, those years were terrible. Sure, some of us are like, but I was super successful. I was like, I was like uh, the, the smartest person in my class. I was the best athlete. Yeah, but you all know that like that was identity in something other than the Lord. When we're in the middle of the who am I, when we know whose we are, what ends up happening is we have a foundation for who we are. And when we know that our ID is in JC only, what ends up happening is I don't find my identity in other things. And dads, if you're like, man, I missed the, I missed the season of, of the kids thing, but now I'm in middle school and high school and I feel like my kids are rebelling, they're resenting, they're in a struggle and everything, I'm like, start now. Meet them where they're at, go to them, tell them the stories of what you struggled with. And maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I missed the boat. My kids are grown up, they don't talk to me. Today's a, worthwhile, a worthless day, I don't like it because Father's Day, my kids don't even celebrate me. Here's what you do, you get on the phone and you call your kids and I'm not saying it'll be easy, but go to your kids and just look at them and say, I'm sorry, but I love you. I'm sorry, not but, I'm sorry and I love you. And here's the thing, they may say nope, they may hang up the phone, they may not take your call, voicemails, you can do it, text it, I, I, I don't care, just go. Fathers, your kids need you to tell them the stories of old. And so Father God, right now, I pray over each and every father in this room. I pray for the fathers who are yet to be fathers. I pray that you would write this on their hearts now for when you provide kiddos for them. I pray for the fathers that are, that are mourning. I pray for the, the people in this room who have lost their father. And this is a painful day. Lord, would you give them peace? And would you stir up in them a hope of what can be instead of the pain of what was? 
So Lord, I pray over each and every person in this room right now that you would show them your love, your power, your might. In Jesus' name. Now,